Hello, hello. If you're listening to this, then you are a Patreon supporter. You help make this podcast possible. And in appreciation of that, I will spare you a long introduction and get right into things. So in this reflection, there are two main things. First, there is me pulling out kind of what I took to be the heart of what Michael Levin shared, right? That mechanism by which biological agents get integrated into larger and larger collective intelligences and reflecting on that a bit. I also found a, a really nice symmetry between things that Michael said and things that Ruben said in my last podcast episode. So I've actually spliced in some of Ruben to really kind of flesh out that symmetry. If that works, the kind of splicing together various guests to show the themes that tie across episodes, uh, it's something I'd love to do more of. So any and all feedback, very welcome. And second, the second thing here, uh, there are three snippets of kind of extra audio from my conversation with Michael. These include our exchange about how and why neurons model worlds, and two examples of him on his research, things that he calls uh, Picasso tadpoles and planarian flatworms. Okay, in we go. So uh, first a recap of what I took as the heart of our conversation, the, the actual nuts and bolts process by which little selves get integrated via evolution into bigger selves, which is really a story of the emergence of collective intelligence within biological systems. And you know, this too, I'll do my best to recap, but I'll actually splice Michael in where his words are, are better than I can do. So let's start at the beginning. And the beginning is nothingness non-existence, right? Pure, undifferentiated absence of all things. And out of this primordial entropy, something comes to exist only by erecting and maintaining a boundary between itself and everything other than it, right? A tree only exists if it maintains its boundary between itself and the rest of the forest. If it gets consumed and rots and decays, that tree no longer exists. Or if I die and my body decomposes back into the soil, I no longer exist, right? I've merged back into that primordial entropy. And this might sound familiar. You may recall that this is kind of the main shtick of the free energy principle, that to exist is to maintain this boundary of separation. And this is always an uphill battle in probability terms, given you know all the possible states and configurations of any system of matter, the overwhelming majority are configurations in which that boundary dissolves and the matter disperses. So anything that exists has this kind of fundamental goal to wind up in one of those limited minority states where that boundary is maintained. And one good strategy for doing so is to minimize uncertainty, right? If you are uncertain about the state you're going to be in in the next moment of time, the odds are that that state will be one where your boundary dissolves and you cease to exist. So now th this thing to continue existing wants to minimize uncertainty, otherwise known as minimizing free energy or surprise. How do you do that when you're a tiny cell, for example, in this massive world? Well, we've skipped ahead because by the time you have a cell, as Michael describes, a cell is already a collection of things, right? There are more primitive forms of life. Uh, he mentioned active matter, chemical droplets, but a cell is already a system with some kind of homeostatic loop, right? Some kind of goal like holding pH constant or metabolism, whatever it is, there's a goal which we can tie back to serving this basic imperative of minimizing uncertainty to continue existing. And this already implies that the cell has some way of internally representing its desired goal state, right? If pH is out of whack, that to, to just to know that means that internally the cell knows what the proper range is, knows it's not in that range and can course correct. And it's in this homeostatic process, you can see the incentive to begin predicting your environment, right? You want to maintain some goal and you want to minimize uncertainty. Well, a good way to do that is to learn patterns, not to be a purely reactive thing, but actually proactive and predictive, at which point you get this. What's the, what's the sort of least uh, surprising thing in your environment? Well, that would be a copy of yourself. So one thing that you might do as a cell that wants to uh, make, make good models, predictive models of its environment is to surround yourself with copies of yourself. Because then 
the cells in the middle, and this is this is uh, something that Chris Fields and I wrote about, is that we, we he called it the imperial model of, of uh, multicellularity. What you might do is say that the cells in the, the cells on the outside are still they're sort of frontline infantry. They're still facing this unpredictable world, but the cells on the inside have a much nicer, more predictable physiological milieu because because uh, their self models match the behavior of the thing they're next to, which is basically a copy of themselves. So you can start a kind of multicellularity that way. So now we get multicellularity, right? We get clusters of cells that group together because it makes their environments easier to predict, at least for the cells in the middle of that cluster. Now, at this point, when cells kind of send signals to other cells in the cluster, the signals are sent out and they hit the exterior of the other cells, right? So the recipient cell notices, hey, something from outside of me is being pinged at me. I can pay attention. I can ignore it, whatever. Now, here is the major kind of evolutionary breakthrough, and it goes by the name of a gap junction. Imagine now that uh, instead of that, what you invent or, or, or discover through evolution is something called a gap junction. A gap junction is this little little protein um, hatch that sits on the uh, surface of cells. It's like a little submarine docking hatch that basically directly connects to another gap junction on the surface of another cell. That the, the magic there is that what it allows is, is signals to go directly from the inside of one cell to the inside of another cell. So think of gap junctions as the literal bridges upon which things travel between cells. So no longer um, are things sent, you know, from the inside of one cell to the outside of another. No, the bridges connect them. So instead, they're sent directly from the inside of one cell to the inside of another. And it turns out that that process of receiving a signal on your exterior membrane was really important in terms of maintaining the boundaries of identity, right? By receiving something from the outside, I can know it didn't come from me. But now things just show up inside of me, right? And I don't know if they came from another cell, if they came from the outside world or what. So whatever happens to a cell that I am gap junctioned to, and, and by the way, I'm saying, you know, I as if I am a cell, so that's probably confusing, but Let's just imagine that I am indeed a cell. Whatever happens to another cell that I have a bridge with is liable to float right across that bridge and become a part of my own interior. So it doesn't make any sense for me to act in a way that might cause pain or somehow harm another cell if the actual molecules or consequences that that, that harm produces may very well just float into my own insides, at which point I won't know whether it's my pain or some other cell's pain right? Ions and such don't have that metadata that says where they come from. So I'm going to treat it as my pain because I don't know the difference. So now every cell that is gap junctioned together has this kind of new incentive landscape, right? Where following their own individual self-interest means acting in a way that won't bring harm to any other cell that they're gap junctioned to. So you lose, you lose the ability to what, what that does is that it raises the boundary between you and me. If we're sharing information, if your memories are my memories and vice versa, and we can't tell who had what memories, right? What happens is that that calcium flux or whatever, whatever that memory signal is, is a false memory as far as cell B is concerned, because that event never happened to cell B. However, it's a, it's a true veridical memory to the new, uh, uh sort of hyper agent that consists of both A and B. And so that ability to share information helps erase, it's a kind of like, uh, you know, like a mind meld, basically, that, that helps erase individuality. And of course, of course, there's a lot of nuances I'm, I'm glossing over, because of course, not everything propagates through these gap junctions and so on. But it becomes harder and harder. So that's, so, so that's the first thing that happens is that, that, that informational that, that erasure, erasure of ownership information binds cells into, um, into into larger larger units. The other thing that does that is stress. So, so that's one thing, right? Gap junctions. The other mechanism he talks about is stress, right? So these bundles of cells basically propagate stress to their neighbors because it then motivates their neighbors to join in the effort to address the cause of that stress so that they will stop receiving that propagation. It's a, he describes it as a cognitive glue um, and with these two main ingredients, gap junctions and stress glue, we get the scaling of goals, the scaling of selves, and the emergence of larger and larger collective intelligence. And so, uh, 
And so stress, right, by, by propagating stress, it means that now, now, now look at what it means. It means that if we, if we are connected, if there are multiple cells that are connected in this way by, by, by informational um, uh, propagation, by stress, it means that now when they take measurements, they take measurements of much larger things. A tissue takes measurement of, of spatially of, of very large things. Also, it takes time for information to cross the tissue. So that means that you are now smeared out in time as well as space. You're not just bigger spatially, you're bigger temporally. So your now moment is kind of thicker. It also means that, uh, so, so you take measurements of bigger things. Your memory capacity is now bigger, whereas before you could only store very simple things as far as your set points. You know, now you're a big network. Network can store all kinds of networks can store all kinds of information. So your your computational capacity is bigger. So, so remember the three things of our homeostatic loop: your measurement, your your memory of your set point, and your action. So your measurements are bigger, your memory is bigger, and the kinds of actions you can take are bigger. Instead of just doing little single cell level things, you're a whole tissue now. You might bend, you might uh, you might uh, you know migrate in a particular way, you might. Uh, um, undergo some sort of deformation so so your actions are bigger everything is getting scaled and because of the because of the scaling of the stress and the scaling of this goal directedness the kinds of things you care about now become much 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 larger right you you you're capable now as a single individual of caring about larger states for example what is the curvature of my tissue it now now it can be in a certain range whereas before single cells don't know about the curvature of your tissues they don't know how many fingers you have but a large collection of cells does right so this is so, so you can see what's happening here this is this is the scale uh, the scaling up of specifically of of goal directedness it's the ability to care and act toward progressively larger and larger things and that's the process i mean look we're all collective intelligences right you know people kind of act as if well an anthill is a collective intelligence but me i'm i'm a centralized you know being no we're all bags of cells right we're all bags of neurons and other kinds of cells and uh what evolution does is it is it apparently uses the same kinds of dynamics and pivots them whereas before you might have been taking care of metabolic problems and transcriptional problems. And eventually, as a multicellular creature, you might have been taking care of anatomical morphospace problems, meaning navigating in the space of anatomical configurations to put your body in, in whatever structure is, is optimal. And eventually, brains and, uh, and muscles came along, and now you can do the same th trick in three-dimensional space. And now you can have goals about moving around and goals about being a rat in a maze or a human with, with you know, long-term goals. So that's kind of a, a whirlwind um, sort of story about um, about the scaling of all this. And then, and then there's another. Now, more broadly, the initial premise of my curiosity into Michael's work was whether this mechanism and his broader research can furnish us with a way of understanding how to raise the agency and intelligence of systems, not only like human bodies, but much larger like economies. I'd actually wanted to title our conversation, uh, Biological Principles for Economic Design, but I wound up feeling that would have been a little disingenuous because we didn't get into economics all that much. But overall, the answer is kind of mixed, right? On one hand, no. Um, the mechanism I just described does not extend beyond the human body, right? The economy is not a system where the parts are integrated together via gap junctions. But if we go a level of abstraction higher, we begin to find some transferable principles, right? As he described with his research on Picasso tadpoles that we'll hear about, Michael's making a pretty radical suggestion as to what evolution is actually doing, right? The actual strategy that is driving natural selection. His claim is that evolution doesn't outfit particular agents, you know, with these particular mutations for particular environments. Evolution doesn't decide that given, you know, this species' environment, it would be good for this insect to develop those scary wings that actually look like a much larger organism that ultimately scares off predators. You know, no, instead, what evolution is doing is just creating these flexible, adaptable agents that can solve problems on the fly. So that when a particular insect is born with this weird mutation where its wings are all misshapen or its eye winds up on its leg or its toe or something, these agents can adapt, right? They can make that work and keep surviving as a kind of basically functional, successful organism, unlike something like a computer, where if, you know, one piece is in the wrong place, the whole functionality can collapse. And being able to persist despite a mutation means that if that mutation is adaptive, you'll wind up surviving at a greater rate than the others without it, and so on. So the kind of real biological principle for economic design, it's, it's not gap junctions, 
it's creating socioeconomic environments that maximize the output or the evolution of flexible problem solving agents who can adapt to shifting environments. And this is actually where my prior conversation with Ruben on meditation comes right in, right? According to, to Levin, what we want is to increasingly create more and more flexible, adaptive problem solving agents. According to Ruben, something like the opposite is happening, right? Our flexibility, you know, maybe is holding constant, maybe decreasing, as I would argue in relation to, you know, the effect of generalized economic insecurity on cognition, while the uncertainty of our environment is increasing. One way that I think predictive processing is interesting in the field of education is in kind of revealing what kind of world we're living in now. So, and and then, and then how the human mind has to deal with that and, and the struggles that come with that. So there's this term called VUCA, and that stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And it's, it's a term that I think the US Army coined after the Cold War sometime. Um, but it, it kind of points to the idea that as the world is getting more globalized, interconnected, and, and the advances in technology that we're seeing, um, and the layers of complexity of having this sort of virtual reality thing happening on top of our ordinary reality, um, is making everything basically more volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous, right? And and from the, if if you think about the organism or uh, the brain, if, if, if we take Friston and, and predictive processing seriously, then the very imperative of the system is to reduce uncertainty. And now we're being flooded with more uncertainty, more VUCA than ever, and it's constantly getting worse. You can kind of, and this is speculative, but you can see, see why we're suffering so much and why we're seeing mental health basically deteriorating and and depression anxiety and stress levels just getting worse and worse because the very thing that the brain is trying to reduce is is increasing out in the world and so this this relates to education directly because it's it's a huge problem for education to know how to prepare children and students for a world that's fundamentally unpredictable we don't know what it's going to look like and what we do know is that it's going to keep on changing and it's going to get more complex more uncertain and in a way more confusing for uh, the predictive system so what do we what do we do in 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 schools to to deal with that and and ruben goes on to make a case that i entirely agree with which is embedding contemplative practice into the kind of basic educational curriculum. But then he goes on to basically echo Michael. But also, I, th I think we need to change the way that we teach in the sense that we need to, in general, imbue children with a sense of agency to, to solve problems themselves rather than to be passive in the classroom, to get them out of this sort of yeah, sitting locked up in classrooms where we're as, as information receivers, because that information, first of all, there's no way that teacher can keep up with the information landscape of today. So we need to teach students instead to be able to be uh, independent problem solvers, to be able to find the information they need to integrate that information and then to, to apply it in moral ways and, and to behave in moral ways with each other and other people. So for me... The interesting question is how to think about designing socioeconomic environments, or, or maybe more specifically, what economic policies have the most leverage in changing our environments such that by virtue of living within them and through them, we produce exactly these kinds of flexible problem solvers. Because one thing that I seem to believe that I don't see others talk about as much is that the economic policies and institutions that frame our lives play such a decisive role in sculpting these environments, whether we're you know, supported or constrained from developing this kind of flexibility and agency. So in future episodes of the show, I'm hoping to dig into exactly this space, right? From this motivating framework that we've gotten kind of from Ruben, from Michael and other episodes earlier on the show, what are the highest leverage policies we have in terms of aligning the development of human beings, 
with the strategy that has already worked for evolution for billions of years, right? Creating these flexible problem solvers who can adapt on the fly. Okay. Now, moving into the, the kind of extra snippets from our conversation. The first segment is this question that I had for him about how and why neurons model worlds. Um, I've spoken a lot about predictive processing on the show, how brains internally model worlds. So it was really nice to actually get more of a concrete look into how that might actually be done. Um, and he wrote on this in that essay I mentioned um, for Aeon Magazine about how evolution hacked intelligence. I really recommend that. But here's what he had to say about it. Yeah, okay, good. So before charging forward into that terrain of larger systems and economies and so on, I do have one more question for the scale we're at now within the body. Um, I was going to ask about pattern completion, but I'm actually going to fold this into the next question and let you uh, bring that into the degree you think it's necessary. But w one of my favorite questions that you've offered an answer to um, is, you know, how the brain using the multicellular groups it's formed, uh, neural circuits, modularity, pattern completion generates these internal models of the world. And the past three or so guests on this podcast, we've all been talking about predictive processing and the idea that, you know, what we experience is not reality itself, but our brain's internally generated model constrained by sensory inputs. And I can follow that. But if I really think about it, it's a crazy proposition that this collection of cells actually accomplish something as astounding as generating these rich, convincing models of the world. And in your essay with Raphael Yusta, Yusti? I don't know how to pronounce that. Um, you gave a, a really filled in picture here. And I thought it was so interesting of how the body does this, right? You were writing about endogenous activity of neurons, turning them into symbols and ultimately building these kind of symbolic worlds. So I wanted to ask about that, this, this question of how brains and bodies, uh, the process by which they actually generate these internal models. Yeah, I think uh, I think the brain basically basically evolution learned this trick long before brains and 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 muscles showed up. So this is just what what neurons do. I th largely are just uh, elaborations of things that individual cells had to do very early on, which is to figure out. I mean, look, you you can tell most of the stories of complex cognition in very simple ways. Uh, I'll, I'll, here, here's here's a here's a simple example of um uh, of of uh, uh, met metacognition, right? Let's say let's say you're a bacterium and uh, you want to do certain things when when the uh, when the sugar concentration gets to a certain level, and so you measure that sugar concentration, then you do certain things, but one thing that could happen, but, but you don't actually care about the sugar concentration per se, what you, what you really care about is your metabolism. And the distinction is that the sugar concentrate, the sugar might be there, but it might be poison. And then, and then, uh, when, you know, when you, you might, you might have plenty of it, but it might not be doing you any good. So one thing that evolution might want to do is pick out, uh, let's, let's, let's run our behavior, not just off of the, the local sugar concentration, but actually off of metabolism. So now what you're doing is instead of measuring the outside world, you're measuring yourself. And so now, what you're doing is you're you're taking measurements off of uh, off of parts of uh, parts of yourself, and then taking uh, taking appropriate action. And so this, I think, is the beginnings of a very simple metacognitive system where you are now telling stories about yourself. The way that you were before trying to guess what the outside world is going to do, you don't have any privileged. Uh, way of knowing where the boundary is as the, the same way that you can measure and take actions based on external events. You can do the exact same thing with internal events. And so I think that, um, uh, for, you know, that, that kind of trick, that ability to, uh, construct yourself on the fly, basically. And by the way, that 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 whole thing is is subject to revision. You, you it's not you don't just do it once and leave it alone. It's it's sort of you have to revise these models all the time. Um, one 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 crazy example of that, if you've ever seen the uh, the rubber hand illusion, right? So this is right. So 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 somebody will somebody will tell you put your hand down. They put a rubber hand on the table. They 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 use a little um a little paintbrush to uh, kind of uh, stimulate the skin on your, on your hand under the table. And at the same time, they, they do the same to this rubber hand that you're looking at. And then they take out, they, they take out a, a, a hammer and they, and they whack the rubber hand and people jump and, 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 you know, jump away from the table. You, 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 how many, how many years has it, has it, how many, you know, millions of years have you been as a tetrapod knowing exactly how many limbs you have? How is it that after five minutes of this sensory stimulus, you've now decided that you have an extra hand? It's, 
It's uh, the, the, right. These things are incredibly plastic and people with, with upside down glasses and, and weird prosthetics where the wrists turn, uh, you know, 360 degrees that normal wrists don't, but we, we are incredibly plastic to changes on those because we do this all the time. Our cells are constantly building these models. And there's a, there's a cool book. Um, and I, I, you know, I don't agree with everything. I'd like, I don't go all the, all the way, but, but, but I think he's really onto a lot, which is uh, Nick Chater's book called the, the mind is flat. And basically what he, what he argues is that th- there is no deep uh, kind of a deep model of yourself that persists, that basically everything is generated right on the fly, that we tell stories about ourselves based on what we just did, based on whatever it was that just happened. And, uh, and, and of course, there's some interesting data to that. I think development is flat that way too. I mean, not entirely flat, but you, 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 all of these cells and tissues are constantly remaking models of themselves and uh, and 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 giving rise to um, uh, to to stories that they have to tell about themselves and what's going on inside and outside, and this gives rise to both the kind of robust uh, function that you're talking about, the, the the building this this incredible picture of of the world and yourself and your your place at the center of it, and also all the failure modes, right? All the all the psychological disorders where people where people don't recognize their own leg as their leg, and and conversely, right? All these all these failures of um, of, of, of causal uh, potency where some, pe- some people end up thinking that they in fact move the clouds in the sky and other people conversely think that somebody else is controlling their body. All of these things are possible because these are failure modes that go all the way back to single cells that, that have to figure out who's in control of what, where do I draw a boundary? Wh- what is the boundary of my causally effective self? And, and all of those things can be done well, or they can be mistaken. And and of course, all of that followed, uh, you know, followed us into the into the brain when when evolution pivoted all these tricks. Yeah. So the the, the point I, I see you make this point a lot in your work that we can find the kind of precursors of things that are happening in the brain like much earlier on that have been going on for millions of years. I want so let me see if I understand the process within the context of the brain. Neural circuits can activate each other endogenously; they don't require stimulation from the outside. And so if I understood correctly, what you were saying the brain does is it's turning patterns of neural circuit activity into symbols, kind of a meaning gets assigned to a particular pattern. So for example, um, when this circuit of neuron fires plus that one plus that one, that kind of unique triple circuit pattern is turned into a symbol that maybe represents the concept apple. So now by activating that pattern of neural activity, the, the, gene can, the brain can generate a model of an apple internally. And it does this for everything, that every part of the world we experience has this kind of hierarchically nested but unique signature of neural activity that the brain can then activate and manipulate at will um, to be the architect of these models. Does is this sound roughly right? Is it kind of the turning of, of patterns of activity into symbols? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, 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 that's right. And the thing to realize is that the consumer of signals and symbols are other selves. In other words, when, when, a, when, a, when a circuit of, of neurons uh, becomes Mm, stabilized when as as a kind of symbol, what are we really saying? What we're really saying is that there's some other tissue in there that is measuring that and has chosen to interpret that state of its neighbors to be interpretable to to interpret that as uh, as a certain uh, as uh, you know it has 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 significance to it in a certain way, right? So everybody's interpreting everybody else. Everybody is watching everybody else, and symbols only have meaning with respect to uh, with respect to a consumer, another another agent. Okay. Now, th- this next bit was couched within our conversation on modularity, right? How a body is a nested system of smaller and smaller functional kind of moderately self-reliant modules. Um, they can get you know, a job done, even if there are mutations or errors elsewhere. And, and you know, this is how mutations don't tank an organism and can be tested out as adaptations. And here he's describing his research on tadpoles as an example of this inaction. Now, now here's what I mean. Here, here's here's some cool examples of um, uh, teleological uh, modularity. If you take uh, if you take a, a tadpole, tadpoles are supposed to turn into frogs, and normally what what happens is their face rearranges itself. Every organ in the face moves in a particular direction, a particular distance, and you go from a tadpole type of face to a frog face. One of the things will happen is that if you and we we discovered this a few years ago. If you make what we call Picasso tadpoles, where things are in the wrong location, so the eyes might be on the top of the head, the, the mouth is off to the side, everything's kind of scrambled, they still make pretty normal frogs. It's amazing. It's because every what, what evolution has done is it, it doesn't give you 
a a machine a hardwired machine where every organ moves in the right direction and and therefore if it starts in the wrong position it'll it'll end up in the wrong position that's not what it makes what it actually makes is a machine that knows how to do error minimization relative and again this is this is back to this this homeostatic loop except that the homeostatic set point at this point is in this case is an anatomical layout it's a region of anatomical morphospace it's not a region of you know ph or hunger level or something like that it's a, it's it's traversing morphospace and what this collective intelligence of cells knows how to do is to find the right region of morphospace even if you start it off in the wrong position so it's got that minimal degree of of competency so a little bit of intelligence that can navigate that morphospace now here's the modularity part. This means that if you put an eye in the wrong part of the head, no worries, it'll get to where it's going, right? We also, you can take this, it's actually much more extreme than that. If you put an eye on the tail of a tadpole, and we've done this, you can, you can make an eye uh, be formed on the, um, on the tail of a tadpole. What will happen is those animals can see perfectly well. Those eye cells, right? It's, it's amazing. Those, those eye cells finding themselves in the middle of muscle instead of brain, no problem. They still know how to make an eye. They make an eye. They make an optic nerve. That optic nerve starts looking around. Sometimes it'll find the spinal cord. It'll synapse on the spinal cord, send its information up to the brain. The brain, which evolved from you know, millions of years expecting visual input from two precise locations in the brain. Now there's some weird itchy patch of tissue on your tail that's uh, sending you some, uh, some signals. Yep, I can recognize that as visual data. Good, my behavior, my, I'm, I'm able to learn in visual tasks, so which, which we've shown. So that, that type of competency is incredibly important for evolution because, because here's what it means, um, among many other things. If you imagine you have a mutation, right? Uh, I mean, if, if you're an engineer or a coder, one of the first things when you when you learn about the uh, the theory of evolution, one of the first things that 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 puts you off is wait a minute. I, I know what happens when you make random changes to things that are, are meticulously built. It, it screws them up. It doesn't right. It's how how often is it that you can make random changes to things that uh, that that they get better? It's extremely rare. So so you start to have doubts about. I mean, okay, evolution in in, in theory works, but but how long would it actually take to get the kinds of amazing uh, uh, biological systems that we that we have here. Well, here here's here's one part that makes it much more powerful. Imagine that uh, you have some mutation, and like like most mutations, they have multiple uh, multiple side effects or multiple things that change. Something something happened in your body that was pretty good. There was a good effect of the mutation, kind of pro pro adaptive, pro survival, but it also put your eye off kilter. In a hardwired, you can see where I'm going with this. In a hardwired animal your fitness would be very low because your eyes in the wrong, your mouth is in the wrong place. You can't see, or you can't eat. Your fitness is, is, is low and you die. And the positive effects of that mutation never get seen because, because you never got the chance to deploy them. Whereas if you can rely on your eye and your various other organs to get their jobs done, even when things change, this drastically smooths the evolutionary landscape, the fitness landscape. It means that you can explore all kinds of things and, a lot of the negative consequences are hidden from from selection because uh, because the, the the parts are competent to take care of business even when something's not quite right and the and and there are many amazing examples if you want to go into this I'll give you some more like remarkable examples of of, of cells doing it. So the the broader point about these tadpoles and this idea of teleonomic uh, modularity the the point they make is that. Evolution doesn't make particular adaptations for particular environments, as I mentioned, right? Instead, it makes intelligent systems, agents that can flexibly solve on the fly. You know, my eye grows on my tail. No problem. This body can make that work. My mouth is on my stomach. All right. We'll rearrange things a bit and everything will be fine. And where this goes is in this next example, where he talks about raid arrays and planarian and flatworms. And, and RAID arrays, I didn't know what they were when he brought them up. They're the, kind of like this hardware gadget for data storage, basically. But as you'll hear, the broader idea is that the selection process through evolution is growing blind to the hardware that it's selecting, right? Instead, what's getting selected is just something that works. So if this mutation caused an eye to show up on the tail and that improved fitness, then great. You know, evolution says, let's do that. What's key is it doesn't know how to do that. It's not privy to the hardware instructions of how to do the things it selects. Instead, it's just selecting for outcomes more like the through the software, right? And he goes on to describe this ratchet effect where as evolution leans into selecting for software that actually masks what's going on beneath the surface in that hardware, the hardware gets less important. Even It might even degrade because what really matters is the software.
But but yeah, I mean, th- 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 there's another there's another really interesting phenomenon here, which is that th- that is is the implication of this kind of um, this kind of competency. Imagine that uh, you are you 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 are selection, and and you are going to judge two animals with respect to the fitness that they have. Uh, you look at them, and they both have pretty correct frog faces, and and as far as the selection goes, they look uh, they look pretty much identical. However, what in in an in an organism that uh, has this kind of competency, so so where where development is actually not dumb, but is actually uh, solving various problems, it might be masking all kinds of uh, genetic uh, uh, suboptimalities. You you wouldn't know because they got fixed. That 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 genome may have issues with it. It may have issues where the eye didn't start out in the right location, but it got to where it needs to go. Now everything's fine. So that that kind of dynamic is interesting because when the uh, when the, when, when, when selection cannot see the actual genome, and of course it never sees the actual genome, right? It's so, you know, so, so selection always takes, uh, takes place over the, over the phenotype, but, but so th- this is particularly interesting when there's this layer of competency between the gene, the genome and the, and the anatomy, then something interesting happens. Uh, this, um, Steve Frank uh, told me this interesting story, um, a few months ago where, you know, RAID arrays, right? These these arrays of of disk of computer disks that are designed to work together to uh, to to make sure that you don't lose data. Um, as soon as RAID arrays started to be developed, the quality of the magnetic media making up individual disks went down because you don't need to make good disks anymore because because don't worry, the RAID you know kind of take uh, takes care of it. So the interest, right? The interesting part of this is that is is that it's a ratchet. Once you get going. Once you've once you've once the industry or evolution or whoever has gotten to that point, you can't let go of the raid anymore because because the media is no good. If you didn't have the raid, the whole the whole thing would just would just not be any good. Uh, the good news about that is that that ratchet basically, when evolution can't make progress by rewarding genomes because it can't see the genome anymore, uh, all the effort goes into uh, increasing the intelligence, the competency of the cells. And I think this is, and again, this is, these are, these are kind of fresh off the, uh, off the, uh, you know, off the uh, press kinds of ideas here. So, so all of this needs to be further developed and tested. But one, one way to think about this is as a, as a really important uh, ratchet, which drives the, uh, the, the increase in competencies because you can't get there anymore by, by trying to weed out the best genomes because you can't see the best genomes anymore. So, so progressively, there's just more and more effort put into the IQ. And, and you can ask, you know, well, what's an example of that? There, there's an amazing example of that, which are these uh, planarian flatworms. These planarian flatworms, they are perfect regenerators. You cut them into pieces. Every piece makes a perfect little worm. And, um, uh, what happens? Uh, what what uh, you know? What what, what the, the, some of these species they they reproduce by pulling themselves in half and then regenerating. So unlike you and I, uh, where our children don't inherit our somatic mutations, right? There's this Weismann's barrier that keeps the keeps the germline pure. They don't. They, so some of these species don't do that. And so when they when any any mutation that doesn't kill the cell gets expanded into the clonally expanded into the next generation because it rebuilds half the worm. So the, the genomes of these animals are just, are just completely screwed up. In fact, some of the, these worms are mixoploid. Every cell has a different number of chromosomes, you know, that normally, normally you would, you would expect that of a tumor. You, you see, you see a collection of cells, right? Where, where every cell and, and, and the genomes are such a mess. I mean, getting the genomic assembly is hard, you know, sequencing the genomes of pain because you don't know what you're sequencing. It's, it's, it's just, it's the, the, the genetics are just so, are just so messed up the anatomy is rock solid 100% uh, of the time they give you perfect shape so now right what 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 is that saying about how little we understand the relationship between the uh, between the genome and the anatomy but i think it's i think it's a perfect example of this all the effort there has gone into the algorithm it's basically that ratchet has basically said all we're going to do is improve it we're going to improve the competency of the cells to build a perfect little worm more or less no matter what your genetics are and uh, and and so there i think there's some really interesting evolutionary pressures that uh, that we need to understand from having having uh, accepted the fact that you're dealing with agents with cells with tissues with organs that have their own agendas they have their own behaviors and everything else is 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 modifications of those and you know this kind of hardware software ratchet has a lot of really wide implications right hardware is the atomic unit of something the smallest parts it's like the it's the preference of a reductionist viewpoint to understand systems by breaking them down into their smallest constituent parts and always and only assigning agency and causal efficacy to those lowest level parts. Instead, Michael's work finds that 
causal power can live at higher levels of systems, right? That reducing things down to their most atomized components doesn't always give us the most interesting or relevant layer of a system. And this is the idea that, for example, drives his cancer research. Rather than looking at oncogenes and the genetic basis of cancer, which is largely how we've done cancer research so far, um, seeing that, you know, cancerous genes get in the body and cause tumors. And so the, the way we approach that is, all right, how do we deal with these individual cancerous cells? What Michael's done is gone a layer up from the hardware to software and looked at what cancer does in the larger system of the body and found that cancerous cells are marked by this kind of depolarization uh, from the body's bioelectric networks. So instead of trying to do things to that individual cell where that kind of oncogene, where the cancer basis is, you can just make sure it stays part of the larger collective intelligence of the body by repolarizing it or, or keeping it polarized. And when you do that, at least in tadpoles, a tumor does not form despite it existing in the hardware component. As long as the cell, the oncogene, remains plugged into the software, the bioelectric network, it doesn't matter whether it's cancerous or not, you don't get a tumor. And this, this kind of software trumping hardware thing, it, it applies well beyond, right? I've written about um, his research as a model to understand um, alienation in sociology, right? Rather than understanding and addressing depression as an individual phenomena, like, oh, you know, you're depressed, let's look at your individual life and figure out why. Instead, look at the software that overlies all the parts. If human beings are, are the hardware of society, the individual components, then the overlay can be seen as our social institutions, right? That kind of foster particular patterns and dynamics. And we can read something like depression or alienation, not as a defect in the individual, but as a depolarization from the software, from society. And the remedy, not as, you know, taking Prozac or going to therapy, but thinking about how to keep individuals plugged into broader social networks. This, this way of seeing, I think, is clearly connected uh, to that question I ended on earlier, right? What role um, economic policy might play in designing these environments? But we're going to have to dwell on that for a bit. So I hope you're all well. Thanks again for being supporters of the show. And I will talk to you next time.